afternoon and welcome to ESOF and to this session, which is on groundbreaking research on when the ground shakes, advancement on earthquakes. My name is Barbara Romanovich. I'm a seismologist and a member of the ERC Scientific Council and will be the monitor, moderator, moderator for this session. I would first like to thank Claudia Jesus Ridin and David Gallego Torres from the ERC for organizing and helping put together this session. And also the technical staff of ESOF 2020 while I can, because I always forget to do it at the end. So earthquakes, as we know, represent a recurring threat to society. Many of the largest earthquakes occur in densely built and populated areas and can result in hundreds of thousands of deaths and billions in economic loss. Through monitoring and studies over the past century, we have gained understanding that the large earthquakes occur primarily at the boundaries of tectonic plates, that they correspond to the release of accumulated tectonic stresses along major fault zones, and that they will recur in a quasi-periodic fashion that depends on the region. We also know that they are complex physical processes due to the complex geological environment in which they occur. And at present, we cannot predict that time of occurrence in any given place. To improve their predictability and the early warning systems that are developed to mitigate their effects, it is necessary to significantly improve our fundamental understanding of the mechanics of faulting through a combination of field observations, monitoring with arrays of state-of-the-art sensors, as well as laboratory experiments. In the sessions, we will hear from four current ERC grantees whose projects address diverse aspects of the relevant research. And so the first speaker is Marc-André Gutscher, who is a senior researcher at the CNRS at the Institut Universitaire Européen de la Mer in Clusane in France. And he uses, uh, he's studying and implementing the use of underwater communication cables towards an earthquake early warning system offshore Italy and Sicily. He is a 2017 advanced grantee of the ERC with project name FOCUS. So please, Marc-André, it's your turn. Um, so good afternoon to everyone. Um, I'm going to be presenting uh, an advanced ERC project called FOCUS, which means fiber optic cable use for seafloor studies of earthquake hazard and deformation, which is a project with two um, major partners, aside from, well, myself and the CNRS, who are the project leaders, and there's Eframer, and then a private company in fiber optics, which is Ideal, located in Lannion, France. Um, the study area is southern Italy, offshore Sicily and Calabria, a region which has been struck by very strong, devastating earthquakes in the past 500 years, caught, and usually associated with major tsunamis as well, and which have caused about 200,000 deaths. Uh, among the challenges in the area is that the um, movements, the tectonic plate movements in the area are quite slow, and the offshore faults are not well mapped, and so their seismic hazard is unfortunately poorly constrained. 
And in this project, in the FOCUS project, we are trying to apply a new technique using laser interferometry on fiber optic cables on the seafloor to try to, de to detect the movement of the submarine faults below the seafloor. So that's the objective of the project. Um, the technique we're trying to apply is BOTDR, which is Brewin Optical Time Domain Reflectometry. And it's a technique which has been used for decades in, uh, for structural health monitoring of major um, engineering structures, things like uh, hydroelectric dams, oil pipelines, bridges, tunnels, uh, etc. And in an ideal um, application where the fiber is well coupled to the structure you are investigating, you can detect micrometric um, deformations at tens of kilometers of distance. So that's like less than the thickness of a human hair at tens of kilometers of distance, and you can position it to within a couple of, of meters or tens of meters of, of position. Um, it's based on the principle that when you send light down a fiber, uh, an optical fiber, there are little imperfections in the fiber and that the light bounces off those imperfections back to your laser reflectometer. And there are three different types of optical phenomenon. There's Rayleigh scattering, there's Brewin scattering, and there's Raman scattering. The Rayleigh is sensitive to very short um, term vibrations. And the Brewin is, is sensitive to strain and temperature variations. And then the Raman is sensitive to only temperature variations. And in this project, I'm primarily trying to apply the Brewin um, technique to detect so deformation, long-term strain um, on the seafloor. So the study area, as I said, is offshore Sicily, specifically offshore Catania, just offshore Mount Etna, the largest volcano in Europe at over 3000 meter elevation. And in this area, there is a seafloor observatory run by the Physics Institute, uh, INFN LNS in Catania. And they set up an observatory at test site south, NEMO, whose primary purpose is to try to detect neutrinos but this observatory is also available for multidisciplinary work. And in the um, framework of this project, uh, I'm planning on connecting a six kilometer long dedicated fiber optic cable from the seafloor observatory, test site south, NEMO, and then crossing a fault on the seafloor, which has recently been mapped, called the North Alfeo Fault. Um, you see seismic images of the North Alfeo Fault from those two seismic profiles courtesy of German um, collaborators out of Kiel. And you can see that it's a very linear vertical structure um, in those seismic profiles, displacing the sedimentary strata on the one side from the other side. And we know that this fault has been moving in recent times because about halfway between our working area and the shore, you, you can see five red triangles on the, to the left. And here a German team um, led by Morelia Urlaub, who, by the way, just yesterday I found out um, got a ERC starting grant, so I congratulate her for the starting grant, and they detected a four centimeter slow slip movement in May 2017 um, along the continuation of the North Alfeo Fault and where it connects to these faults on the southeast flank of Mount Etna, which allow the entire edifice to gradually slide to the east into the ocean. So this is a, a closer up zoom of the study area where you can see test site south. You can see the planned route of our uh, six kilometer long cable. Uh, in green, the green circles are the planned, tentatively planned position of a network of seafloor geodetic stations. And further to the west, halfway between there and the shore, you can see the five uh, positions of the Guillomar um, geodetic network. And then the, you can see in black and thick black, the trace of the um, currently uh, operating uh, seafloor cable and observatory. And here's a zoom now of the area. So you can see the test site south of the gray circle, and you can see the trace in pink of our planned um, deployment of the fiber optic cable, which is planned to cross the fault three times and in two different directions. So that given the dextral strike slip movement of the fault, the southernmost segment should be extended, the central segment should be shortened, and the northwesternmost segment should be lengthened. And so we should have repeated measurements at different positions along the cable to try to confirm any movement that we may observe. Uh, this is an, uh, the device that we will use to deploy the cable. This is a deep sea plow designed by Yves Toulon. Uh, we performed some tests in early March 
And the system is meant to be um, operated by and um, pushed by the ROV Victor, the Ephraimer uh, unmanned submersible. And there you can see the um, robot arm of the ROV Victor. And like I said, these were tests performed in early March offshore Toulon in about uh, 600 meter water depth, where it was just a mechanical test to see that we can uh, deploy, unroll, unravel the cable with a given tension on the cable and then bury it um, some 20 centimeters on the sea floor, below the seafloor. If you look to the right, you can see the groove after the deployment. And on the left, you can see the ROV Victor 6000. Um, now, this is an image uh, of, on the right of the cable itself. It's a nine millimeter diameter uh, cable, which can resist uh, about one ton of lift of tension on the cable itself, uh, 500 uh, kilo working load. Its internal design, you can see on the left, it has three fibers in the core, which are in a tightly bound configuration, means they are um, tightly connected to the a hydrocarbon um, how casing around it. And then we have two fibers in an external steel tube, which is part of the light armoring. And those two are in a uh, lightly, so uh, loose bound configuration. And to the lower left, you can see an example of our BOTDR interrogator. We actually bought two for the project, one by the CNRS, which is currently in the uh, sea port facility of, in Catania, and has been acquiring data for a few months now. And it's a VIA V BOTDR interrogator. And the other interrogator, the one in Lagnon, is a Phoebus model. And so these were um, tests done in the lab back in November and December of last year, uh, where we elongated a portion, we stretched a portion of the uh, cable you see on the right. And then you can see the peak, the response to that stretching um, by the BOTDR interrogator on the left. Uh, this is now an image of the um, plow with the full 6.2 kilometers of fiber optic cable reeled onto it. The yellow sort of box you see um, to the left, that is the cable end module, which has these connectors necessary to connect it to the seafloor observatory using ODI Teledyne wet mate connectors, which can be operated by the ROV, um, by the ROV Victor. And uh, this is, um, these are further steps of the um, experiment which are planned, where um, I probably didn't mention it, but I should have. We're planning on going out in about one month, the first expedition, Focus X1, where we will deploy the six kilometers of cable and, and put down the eight um, seafloor geodetic uh, stations, which will provide an independent measure of the relative movement of the two blocks on either side of the fault. And, um, and in a second experiment um, tentatively scheduled for late 2021, probably November, uh, we're planning on putting down a network of a passive seismological network consisting of uh, 30 ocean bottom seismometers, 15 from the Ephraimer and CNRS group, 15 from Guillaumar, who is also a major collaborator in this project. And this will also be supplemented by existing permanent land stations shown in pink on land run by INGV. And INGV is also um, agreed to deploy some temporary land stations, uh, possibly closer to the coast uh, in positions shown tentatively by the blue triangles. Uh, and then finally, this is, uh, um, so the, the multicolored little circles you see offshore and onshore, uh, that's the existing seismicity. The little red traces are the mapped faults offshore based on morphology and on some seismic profiles. And uh, the current locations, especially offshore, are rather poorly constrained because there's a very limited uh, coverage by seismic stations. It's only the pink triangles on, on shore. And so as well, the cutoff magnitudes are higher offshore and the exact position in, uh, you know, laterally in XY as well as in depth um, are not that well known. And it's possible that after our deployment of the passive seafloor seismological network, that some of these diffuse positions will collapse onto um, you know, specific faults. And they may also image a portion of the uh, downgoing uh, plate interface because there is a subduction zone hereby. I did not mention that earlier, but for those who know the area well, there is the the um, Ionian, Tyrrhenian, Calabrian subduction zone, which goes from the major uh, accretionary wedge, which is in the Ionian Sea, um, beneath 
then northeastern Sicily, Calabria, beneath the Aeolian Islands, and then the, the earthquakes continue down to 500 kilometer depth beneath the Tyrrhenian Sea. So that's also another potential source of um, earthquakes and of seismicity. And we hope to be able to better constrain that as well um, through the sco scope of this project. And that's the end of this presentation. I have some extra slides for questions, if there are any questions, and I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marc-André. Can I speak? Okay, so thank you very much, Marc-André. Actually, I think we have uh, maybe two minutes for questions. So I will ask you some questions. Uh, we'll have more at the end. I'd like to know how you will deal with the huge amount of data that you're going to generate on this cable. Okay, um, the technique we're using, BOTDR, uh, does not generate the same massive volume of data which the IDAS, the Distributed Acoustic Sensing Technique, um, generates. The DAS is much more uh, a real-time um, technique, and within a day, it can generate like a terabyte of information. The BOTDR, uh, typically the acquisition times are maybe five to 10 to 20 minutes. You can sort of select them, and then it averages what's been acquired over those uh, 10 minutes. And so the total data volumes are much lower than in the, in the DAS situation. So it's less of a technical challenge. Thank you very much. And then quickly, one last question. Which component of strain are you measuring and how are you going to calibrate it? All right, um, it's strain along the cable. So because the, the cable is, is more or less linear, but that's why also with the path, um, the pr potential path we've selected, we're going across the fault in different orientations. So we should be getting extension, um, shortening and extension if all goes well. Plus with the five fibers we have, we're looping back over the fiber. So, because um, we have two ac um, access to two live fibers. So we'll have in a sense, multiple repeated movements. And the BOTDR technique will give you elongation or shortening along the axis of the fiber. And, that, and those movements will um, in principle be calibrated by the seafloor uh, geodetic network using acoustic beacons and that send acoustic pings back and forth and they, they measure baselines. It's the same technique that Morelia Urlop um, used uh, closer to Mount Etna. And so they should show that there is extension or shortening um, along different components of the baseline, which will tell us how much movement went on at a given time. That unfortunately is not recorded in real time. We'll have to go back and download the data, whereas the BOTDR data will be acquired in real time and are accessible from the port facility in time. Okay, thank you. Uh, we can uh, continue this discussion later. I think we should go on to the next speaker. Thank you very much. So good afternoon, everyone. Wait, wait, wait a minute. I'm supposed to introduce you. Oh, I say, sorry. I'm very sorry. <laughs> okay, so very briefly, Marie Violet is assistant professor at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne in Switzerland. She studies the mechanical behavior of fluid-induced earthquakes, and she's an a 2015 ERC starting grantee on a project called Define, if I say it correctly. Your turn, Marie. Thank you. Thank you. So good afternoon, everyone. Today, I would like to talk about the energy budget of earthquake from a lab perspective. Um, this work has been funded by the ERC. And first, I would like to thank my collaborators, Dr. Uh, François Pasleg and uh, Federica Pagliallonga. So uh, earthquakes are due to slip and fall surfaces and rupture and friction are the key to understand the physics of both natural and man-induced earthquakes. 
uh, earthquake nucleates at depths at about uh, up to 15 uh, kilometers of out. That means pressure up to 200 MPa and temperature up to 300 degrees Celsius. Seismology is the main discipline to understand the physics of these earthquakes. However, it gives only a limited information of what is happening at depths, since most of the instruments are deployed uh, on the subsurface. And today, we'd like to show you that uh, laboratory seismology can uh, give some uh, information about the physics of these earthquakes. Earthquakes are due to a sudden release of elastic energy that is stored in the crust during the interseismic period. And this energy is uh, dissipated in terms of friction and heat. And what you can see on the uh, panel on the uh, left is uh, um, a fossil fault zone in Adamello in Italy. And what you see in black is a pseudo tachylite that is a, a vein of melt that form uh, by a frictional melting. Uh, this energy can also be dissipated in terms of deformation. And this is uh, in the panel in the middle, one example of the Christchurch uh, earthquake in 2010 in New Zealand. Finally, uh, uh, this energy can be released in radiated waves. And this is an example of Mexico City in uh, 85. The uh, radio uh, uh, radiated waves are responsible of the destruction of the engineering structures. Another way uh, to look at uh, this uh, uh, earthquake energy budget is the evolution of the shear stress versus slip during the dynamic ruptures. And this is the diagram that you have on the left, where you can see, uh, see shear stress uh, on the epsilon axis and slip on the um, uh, x, uh, x uh, uh, axis. Uh, the uh, shear stress uh, starts from a background stress that I call uh, to, to zero here, and then uh, increase up to a peak value to epsilon, then decrease uh, abruptly up to, uh, uh, until a steady state uh, shear stress, and it can recover up to a peak friction at the end of the earthquake. Seismologists have access uh, to the radiated wave thanks to the seismological data, and this energy is uh, depicted in green uh, in my diagram. Can have access also to the static shear stress through so the uh, uh, to the sh uh, static shear stress drop. Sorry, so the uh, stress drop between uh, to zero uh, to uh, to uh, uh, f. Um, and so this is the energy that is depicted in blue, but they can't have access to the dynamic friction tau d. So to the heat and fracture, so the energy that is depicted in uh, orange in this diagram. One uh, important estimate is the energy release rate, which is the energy uh, that, that is needed uh, to propagate the rupture. And this energy uh, can be estimated uh, by seismologists doing the uh, energy depicted in blue minus the radiated energy in green. However, we don't know what is the shape of this energy, so we, we don't know how the shear stress involves uh, during sleep. So the energy can be uh, like, um, like this one or can be like this one. So it's, very, it's quite uh, important to understand how this, uh, this energy and what is the shape of, it, uh, of this energy. Uh, we can estimate this energy on the field. And it seems that this energy is uh, comprised between few joules to uh, megajoule and it scale with a uh, slip and the length of the fault, but it seems that is also independent of other type of condition than uh, the geometry of the fault or the uh, uh, state of uh, lubrication on the fault. Today, what I would like to show you that we can get insight on the evolution of the dynamic shear stress during earthquake rupture, thanks to uh, earthquake, uh, so thanks to laboratory uh, work and trying to reproduce earthquake in the lab at uh, pressure and temperature representative of the uh, earth crust. Basically, we can perform two types of tests, tests at uh, low pressure and low temperature, where we can deploy a large number of sensors like strain gauges, where we can measure the uh, different components of the strain field, uh, acoustic sensor to measure small acoustic emission, accelerometers, uh, laser sensors, and we can record uh, this measurement at very high frequency up to uh, 10 megahertz. And with this measurement, we can get uh, insight on the physics of, um, uh, of, uh, of the rupture. We can also perform uh, higher pressure and higher temperature experiments to be more realistic. However, it's a bit more difficult to deploy a large number of sensors, but in the uh, ERC 
uh, project B fine, we develop a new high pressure, high temperature, uh, triaxial press that can go up to 200 uh, degrees Celsius, 200 uh, megapascal uh, in terms of confining pressure, and uh, we can deploy up to 16 um, uh, strain gauges, 16 uh, uh, acoustic uh, sensor and fiber optics uh, to understand a little bit better what's happened during the rupture. So this is one example uh, of what we can uh, do in the lab, and this is a biaxial friction test uh, on rock samples. These are linear motors in the machine. The samples are in the vessel here, and during this test, we can have access to the evolution of the shear test versus leap or versus time in this case. And we can compute what I uh, call the fracture energy. So the fracture energy is what is depicted in red here, is the integral of the curve uh, um, up to the steady state. Uh, this energy is also called breakdown energy in seismology, and I will uh, tell you a little bit why later. In the lab, we find that this energy is comprised between a few joules to uh, kilo joule, and uh, interestingly, uh, what we see is that if we plot it uh, in a similar diagram that is uh, fracture energy or breakdown work versus sleep, what we find in the lab scales with natural earthquakes and also other lab, uh, lab earthquakes um, that were acquired in the past. Interestingly, also, is that if we perform uh, this test in presence of water or with other type of lubricant like glycerol, they all uh, fall uh, on the same line and follow the same scaling law than natural earthquake. We can also perform other type of uh, experiments in the lab where we can really reproduce the dynamic rupture. What I forget to tell you uh, before is that the previous friction experiments, uh, we don't have a very dynamic rupture. We are just applying a constant uh, velocity function and looking at friction. Here we can also reproduce really uh, um, uh, dynamic rupture and uh, we perform experiments uh, uh, between two uh, blocks of rocks. We deployed a large number of sensors, as I tell you, uh, strain gauges, acoustic emission sensor, and we try to acquire the measurement at very large frequency. What we are trying to do is uh, to derive the fracture energy from the stress field at the crack tip and model it with a, a linear elastic fracture uh, mechanics model. What we found, is that uh, uh, we can uh, effectively uh, fit our uh, strain field measurements, so the free uh, component of the strain field with a LEFM uh, model, also with a cohesive zone model. So it seems that we can really um, um, understand uh, earthquake rupture with uh, fractures. But in this case, the estimate of the fracture energy is only a few joules uh, per uh, square, uh, square meters. However, if we look at from the same measurement how the uh, shear stress uh, involved with sleep, it seems that we have a, two, uh, a double weakening model with a first loop that corresponds to the uh, cohesive zone model, so to rupture, and the second one that uh, maybe is due to, uh, the real, enfin, to the evolution of friction uh, um, uh, with sleep, so uh, the evolution of the shear stress with sleep, and this is maybe the breakdown work. So the first part of the energy corresponds to the LEFM model, and is a few, uh, few joules per square meter, and the second one uh, can correspond to the breakdown work. And in fact, if we plot uh, to this measurement uh, in the same diagram, breakdown work versus co-seismic sleep, what we see is that the breakdown work uh, that we uh, get from the previous measurements, so from the dynamic uh, rupture experiments, scale again with uh, natural estimate, uh, uh, natural earthquake estimates, and also with uh, previous uh, lab experiments. And again, the breakdown work is, uh, is uh, a function of the co-seismic sleep. So to better a little bit understand what are the relation between this uh, rupture energy and the breakdown work, what we did is uh, that we perform a numerical model with a spectral method uh, where we impose in one case, one single weakening me uh, mechanism. And this weakening mechanism, the energy uh, associated with this weakening mechanism uh, is the energy that we can get with uh, LEFM measurement. And a second model uh, where we impose uh, first weakening mechanism that uh, correspond to LEFM, and the second one that can be the breakdown work. 
in this model, we put a barrier that is a low stress uh, zone in the model to see how the rupture is evolving. And what you can see is that when you have a single weakening uh, uh, mechanism, so you have just the uh, energy link to, uh, I will say, just the fracture energy, what you have is that the rupture is stopping uh, when uh, we uh, arrive to the barrier. However, when we have the double weakening, so when we have the breakdown work, what we have is that the rupture starts uh, to stop, but we have a second rupture that is nucleating and we can pass the barrier. So it seems that uh, earthquake is really a dynamic fracture that we can model with uh, linear elastic fracture uh, mechanics, but it seems that the breakdown work, so the, all the uh, energy linked to friction, uh, can fed a little bit the, uh, the dynamic of fracture and help uh, passing some barrier. So the take home message of this presentation is that uh, studying earthquake at the lab scale is a, an opportunity to significantly enhance our understanding uh, ability and uh, a forecasting ability of seismicity in controllable, uh, repeatable and safe environment under varying condition. I show you that most of the process or at least uh, fracture energy uh, are scale invariant. So what we find in the lab scale with uh, natural observable, and that the earthquake energy budget, uh, fracture energy, frictional heat, and radiated energy is accessible in the lab uh, in details. And it shows that earthquake seems a dynamic fracture that can be fed by frictional processes. And I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Marie. Again, um, I will take the privilege of asking you a question, uh, which you. is, um, you haven't told us which uh, materials you're using in your experiments and uh, are they homogeneous and uh, what would be the effect of heterogene heterogeneous materials as uh, encountered in nature? Okay, so in the lab we use, um, generally we use standard rocks that are very homogeneous, uh, low porosity, uh, small grain size, in order to be, rep uh, in order to be uh, repeatable. However, this is not the case in nature. So it's, of course we are missing some component like the component of uh, full roughness that is not really present in our test. So most of the sample are uh, well polished. Uh, we are missing the effect of porosity. We are missing the effect of very big clasts. We are missing the effect of geometry, but it's a very simple, um, uh, simple setup to really start understanding what it's, it's happening, and then we can add some complexity later. Okay, very interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, we should move on to the next presentation. Massimo Cocco is Director of Research at the Istituto Nazionale di Geofisica e Vulcanologia in uh, Rome. He is the coordinator of the EPOS, the European Plate Observing System program, one of the principal investigators also of the 2019 ERC Synergy Project FEAR, uh, in which uh, the uh, collaborators study mechanics of earthquakes and faulting from observations of natural faults through geophysical and geological measurements to experimental faults at the laboratory scale. And I guess he will be talking to us about EPOS. Your turn, Massimo. Thank you, thank you very much and welcome uh, to everyone. Yeah, in my presentation, I would like uh, to deal uh, with um, a specific issue, which is the sharing of scientific data in solid earth science. 
Uh, in the previous two presentations, you have seen how data can be collected on the field or in the lab. But the issue here is how data can be shared. So the, the issue we refer to solid earth science. Solid earth science uh, uh, concern earthquakes, which is the topic of, uh, of today, but also volcanic eruptions, tsunamis, tectonics, genetic data, and laboratories. You have seen in the previous uh, first presentation how the collection of data offshore are very relevant for earthquakes, but of course also for tsunami, tectonics, and geodesy. Solid Earth Science uh, inc involves uh, very different communities, and uh, it is uh, intrinsically multidisciplinary. Therefore, integrating the data and sharing the data requires a community building. Moreover, in Solid Earth Science, we operate services for society, for uh, the surveillance of the national territory, volcanic or seismic or tsunami surveillance, and in particular, geohazards, uh, georesources, and anthropogenic hazard. Uh, the earthquake, uh, to focus on the earthquake, I would like uh, to show you how studying an earthquake is intrinsically a multidisciplinary uh, task. This uh, that you see in the picture here is the earthquake rupture model of the 2009 L'Aquila earthquake. You see the fault at depth, and you see with the color here the area, so the fault plane where the sleep is concentrated. And you see on the, on the surface, which more or less correspond to the L'Aquila city, the subsidence, since this is a normal fault, and therefore the area that is red in the figure simply move down with respect to the foot wall, which is the opposite side. Now, to study this uh, rupture model and to provide the interpretative model nearly in real time to the uh, civil protection, for instance, we use a very different data. First, we use uh, seismological data, but seismological data are very different data. For instance, historical seismicity, microseismic intensity, earthquake location, magnitudes, uh, moment tensor, seismograms, uh, strong motion data, measure of ground shaking, attenuation of the ground motion parameters, uh, shake maps uh, or seismic hazard maps. Collecting these data and these data products involve very different communities and they are presently stored and partially accessible to different communities and very different repositories. Even if uh, seismologists are the most, uh, I would say, uh, proactive, the best example for data sharing because in seismology we share data in real time and the data that we share are uh, standardized and quality control. But to monitor and to study an earthquake, we also use geodesy. And geodesy involve uh, GPS displacement, stray maps, uh, satellite data, and interferograms, uh, high rate uh, GPS time series. This implies that to access to these data products uh, require expertise on processing the data. And even a skilled seismologist might not be expert on to have access and to process a GPS displacement to get a velocity maps, a strain or a displacement, a tectonic displacement. We use a geology, geological map, the active fault map, a paleoseismological data. And somewhere we use also laboratory experiments and geochemical data. So this is only to, to, to show you that for study a single earthquake, we need and to, to get access and to have the capability to interpret very different data. And uh, these data and scientific products are generated by different communities and are uh, accessible by different uh, uh, data infrastructures, which might require skills and also knowledge in order to use it. And uh, a particular mention, since we are dealing with earthquake, uh, is referred to induced seismicity and anthropogenic hazard. Because in this case, the monitoring of these areas, these are other areas that are exploited for georesources and geoenergy. So the data usually came from the private sector. There is a restricted access to this data because uh, they are not available to scientists. Therefore, you need authorized access to services. And the hazard assessment usually is done for the industry. Therefore, the risk of communication for society implies relevant ethical uh, conditions. And this is a scientific challenge to identify, that to interpret if an earthquake is natural, triggered, or induced. 
triggered means just advanced in time and induced is a network that will never happen and is just generated by the anthropogenic activity. Therefore, this is another example of data that uh, involve uh, the scientific research, uh, whose uh, share, which sharing is even more challenging and difficult. EPOS uh, that Barbara just announced, it is uh, a research infrastructure which uh, relies on a long-term integration plan of existing a new research infrastructure to share the data for solid earth science. Therefore, not only for earthquake and seismicity, but also from geology, geodesy, and, uh, and um, anthropogenic hazard. EPOS involves uh, 25 countries, the scientific communities for 25 countries uh, to share the data, six, uh, not five, uh, international uh, organizations, and mostly 140 research organizations in Europe. It is quite a big uh, uh, challenge. Of course, the vision and the mission of EPOS rely on open science. Open science means for us mostly access to data from funded research, but also to research tools and to try to develop open research e infrastructures in order to provide access. But we refer to data. And therefore, open data uh, means uh, data that anyone can access, use, and share. The data becomes usable and made available in a common machine-readable format. And also, the data are licensed, because in any case, we need to respect intellectual property rights and also the traceability and accountability of the data providers. So the, the architecture of EPOS is the following. We rely here on the national research infrastructures. This, for instance, is the Italian Seismic Network, the French Geodetic Network, the German Geodetic Network, and so on. Networks that already exist and generate data. Good data requires good management of the research data over the entire life cycle, which is this blue circle that you see in the picture. And this can be done only by the scientists who de deploy the instruments and collect the data. So we have integrated them and we have asked them to be involved in distinct community integration. For instance, seismology here is one of these 10 communities, but there is also near fault observatories, GNS, uh, GPS data, volcanic observation, satellite data, geomagnetic, anthropogenic hazard, the geological information, the laboratories, and also the underground laboratories, uh, the geoenergy deathbed. So what we ask to this uh, different community is to share the data the data products, the software and the services, and to be centralized, to make them interoperable from a central lab where user can have access to this data. And this will be done, is coordinated by a European consortium, which is Eposteric, where presently 13 countries have already joined, and we expect to increase the number of countries that will join. But I repeat that to presently, 25 countries are involved in the data generation and the integration plan. So with this architecture, we wish to provide access to users through an integrated core services central lab, which is a new infrastructure, which is currently implemented and that will be opened to operational phase in the next two years. An operational testing will start in October 2020. And of course, our goal is to make this data fair, which means findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable, and in principle, reproducible, even if reproducibility is quite tricky, in particular for lab data. Uh, the, the, the idea, uh, the general philosophy is uh, simple. We want to provide access to data in order to foster the use and reuse of scientific data to foster and promote the integrated use of data and data products, but also the access to facilities, I mean uh, laboratories, uh, therefore the physical access of scientists who can need to access to a facility, to a laboratory to perform experiments. And uh, the laboratories are included in the EPOS community. A new community is coming from Tsunami that they are already well structured, and we hope that they will join us in the forthcoming uh, years. Now, the, the final goal is to promote understanding. So through the access to this data, 
uh, we can uh, uh, share the modeling and the processing and also to foster data massive application. The idea here is to try to make the scientists who use raw data or basic data to develop scientific products and to convince them to share these products. Therefore, a user can become a data products provider. And this, of course, concerns also the ERC grants, because in this case, the grants develop new laboratory, new facilities, and when the grant is finished, they need to be in a framework in which the data and the software and the modeling can be preserved. But of course, the final goal for this is to foster discovery, which is a new idea and serendipity, but also to try to increase the sharing of the data and the experience in order to support authoritative services for society, but also training and education, provide access to data and to services to university. And in general, I believe that this is the best way to get trust in the society, and this is the best way to have uh, links and interactions with the private sector and society. Just a second to show, to mention you, I don't have time to get in the detail of this issue, but I want to mention you that uh, for solid earth science, the relationship with industry is important, but does to obey to ethical principles because many of the research organizations are involved in the monitoring of the national territories and therefore the primary goal is impartiality for public goodness. And EPOS now it will be soon open to the users and uh, I hope that uh, we will be able to succeed in making uh, this infrastructure operational and we spent more than 10 years to develop, design, implement, and open this infrastructure. And we are now at the crucial step, which is just preceding the operational phase. And I thank you for your attention and for inviting me to this important event. Yeah, no. Thank you very much, Massimo, and sorry for the <laughs> little. Uh, so Massimo has presented this uh, very impressive uh, project, which you can imagine uh, is a huge undertaking involving so many different communities and so many different systems and uh, of data collection and distribution that it is, we are looking forward to uh, it becoming live uh, very soon. I um, think we will go on to uh, the next speaker now and leave the questions for, for the um, questions session of question session. So Domenico Giardini is Professor of Seismology and Geodynamics at the ETH in Zurich. He directed the Swiss Seismological Service and presently directs the Swiss Competence Center for Energy Research. He has been involved in the successful INSIGHT mission, which delivered the broadband seismometer to Mars and is now collecting data from Mars. And he's also, like Massimo, a, co a principal investigator and he also the coordinator of the ERC Synergy Project FEAR. And I guess we will hear about this project from him. Your turn, Domenico.
Thank you, Barbara, for the introduction. Thank you for the invitation. Um, my job today, it's easy because of the introduction of the other speakers that we had before. Uh, Massimo uh, presented the need, absolute need for a science like ours to have infrastructures that allow us to collect data and not only one infrastructure, but how to share infrastructure at different scale in different disciplines, uh, in different locations in order to acquire uh, data on one of the most elusive phenomena that we have in nature. And uh, Maria, uh, at the same time, showed us what really one such infrastructure is and how much you can really learn if you get into the details using this kind of class of infrastructure, these laboratories. I will speak today in the name of a group of investigators, which includes Stefan Wimmer, Florian Amman, and again, uh, Massimo Cocco, on the large scale experiments and the large scale facilities to study fault activation and earthquake rupture. When I say large, uh, I mean the capability of getting close to faults and generating quakes on the faults on a scale of 50, 100 meters, and then study how the faults behave. Uh, this is very complementary to all of the other uh, measurements that we do on quakes. We do need to remember a few details on quakes. For example, the, the sequence in central Italy in 2016, this was a sequence uh, that lasted over one year with 85,000 events, so many more, but 85,000 recorded at that time, over 110,000 buildings lost. And this is a stark reminder that earthquakes don't come alone. They are connected to each other. They are the dominating natural risk in many areas of the earth. And currently is the one uh, natural hazard that nobody can forecast reliably. It was a complex sequence of large events involving many different faults that uh, at the distance of a few months moved one after each other. Now, we have seen that many times, the example of Christchurch, uh, Ridgecrest and many others. It's a proof that earthquakes and faults interact. Uh, one event triggers another, and the other perhaps will not come next week, will come 10 years from now. But the redistribution of stress and the modification, the strain in the crust, the, um, the, the role of the fluids are fundamental to understand what and where the next quake will be. And today, we are not very far. We are still where we were 30 years ago. And we say just uh, probabilistically, statement like the chance of an event in the next week is about 5% in that area. So despite decades of intense research, many first order scientific problems are still to be solved. What do we need? We need much richer observations since we do not know uh, where quakes uh, really are gonna be the large quakes, we cannot be there. Uh, it's only very rarely that the fault gets measured and we can actually be there and see the quake. And even in that case, it's hard to understand. Think about the last big quake in Japan. Japan is the best monitored uh, country in the world in terms of uh, quakes and still a magnitude nine, it was impossible to be seen arriving. Now we need control and repeatability. We are physicists, we like to repeat experiments and so produce earthquake under control uh, conditions. We need integration. So we need to reconcile seismological observation, laboratory data, geological observation. This was shown very well by Massimo before. We need to work on the initial conditions. We cannot just wait randomly until an earthquake come. We need to control the initial conditions so that we can understand what will be generated. And then we need universal values. Uh, there is up to a certain point an interest in understanding perfe perfectly how a certain fault behaves unless we are able to translate to other faults at the tectonic environment this knowledge. So after many years of experiments at different scale, what we proposed to uh, ERC was experiments to be able to induce our own quakes under control repeatable conditions at a scale of up to 50, 100 meter and uh, deep down in the crust up to one kilometer. And this is the experiment I will show. Now, a quake and earthquake dynamics are complicated to explain. The shear stress on the fault is a function of slip, slip rate, uh, state variables. This was shown by Maria before. There are many parameters that influence what the quake will do. 
and uh, we need to control the fault properties during and after a earthquake and before a quake and use this knowledge to predict the evolution of, of the rupture. Now, normally we study the fault only after the quake. We use seismology to do that. We use geology to explore the whole thing, or we go all the way to the other scale and we use laboratory to go in detail. We extract faults from, we extract rocks from that fault environment and we study these faults. We, uh, we study these rocks, we break them to understand how they can actually generate quakes. But we obviously have a problem of scale. Uh, we control, in a non-predictable way, only from the surface, a 50 kilometer square uh, scale, which is the natural scale of the quake. We control very well uh, the 50 millimeter scale in the labs, but we are far from actually real quakes. And so what we are aiming at is to try to control fault scale uh, close to what real quakes are. Now, normally, this is the end image from which we start. Something that we map after the quake uh, takes place. We measure the slip, slip velocity. We do kinematic inversion of real uh, data after a quake. And then we derive slip velocity history and we apply all of our model, elastic dynamic inversions and so on, uh, uh, constitutive equations. And we derive what we think uh, where the property of the fault that produced this quake. So we infer what we assume where the prior stress and traction change evolution. We have, however, however, no way to verify that our knowledge is correct and our equation of states are correct. Now, in fear, we want to invert this cycle. So we want to start from imposing a stress condition uh, and traction conditions on the fault and then predict out of our models what the velocity history and slip distribution of the quake will be, and then generate these quakes and verify the velocity and slip distribution. So instead of starting from a real quake and go all the way down to what we think were the previous conditions, we impose their priori conditions and we check what quakes will be uh, generated. Now, it's easy to say that on a cartoon, it's much more difficult to do it in real, uh, conditions. If you are assuming that uh, a scale in a lab is between uh, the one centimeter and the one meter scale, until now the experiments that have been conducted on real faults reach the 10 meter scale at the depth of 500 meters, uh, the deepest one we're in the Grimsel uh, lab until now in Switzerland. And we want to go to this scale, the 100 meter scale and the depth of a thousand kilometers. We want a volume of crystalline rock at depth with good accessibility so that we can get very close to it in good experimental conditions. We want to install inside this volume of rock hundreds of sensors and in effect transform this volume of rock into a single integrated sensor system. And then we want to start injecting water on the falls, produce quakes inside the volume of rock that will transmit back to us the information on what is happening inside the volume when we change stress and we perturb the local conditions. Now we have a lab that is able to do that. We uh, refurbished the tunnel uh, under the Alps uh, two years ago and we transformed it into a deep underground lab for geoenergy and geoscience experiments. And this offers today unique experimental conditions for real size faults and earthquake physics. It's uh, overburden of one kilometer of granite on top. Uh, you can drive in the tunnel. Inside the tunnel, two kilometers from the entrance, you have a big cavern. It's 100 meter long and uh, uh, two six meter wide. Uh, we have cleaned it up, paved the whole thing. It's, we are installing all the sensors that we need. We have several kilometers of boreholes and carrots where we check the rocks that we have. We have mapped all of the faults and we are doing already a number of experiments. What uh, the first actually 300 meter scale stimulation, it's uh, ongoing. Now, what makes this type of experiments unique? The scale, the experimental design, I would say the depth, uh, the fact that we are able to be at one kilometer depth with full control, almost as if we were inside a lab. And then of course, the integration of experimentation, modeling and uh, forecast evaluation. Now, how will we change? Uh, we propose to change the stress on the fault, which is buried inside the mountain. Um, 
out from our lab, if this is the fault that we target, we will then have an experiment tunnels, which allows us to walk parallel to the fault. And then we select different uh, blocks of the fault, so 50 meter lengths each. Uh, in each one of them, we uh, bore it, as I explained before. We, we put sensors of all types. We want to measure strain, stress, uh, borehole, pressure. We want to make tilt. We want to measure temperature changes, velocity. Uh, we have both active and passive systems to generate our own uh, velocity to check uh, to our own uh, small quakes to generate to check the velocity in the medium. And then we will then uh, do a different classes of experiments, changing, for example, the normal pressure on the fault or activating a nearby fault to check what the stress induced on this particular fault that we are targeting. And we will use also the proximity of the fault to the tunnel, which changes the effective stress on the fault. So we have six years to perform four classes of different experiments of different segments of this fault. Now, the multi-parameter is absolutely uh, crucial. We want to measure, in a sense, everything that can possibly be measured. Uh, there is no point in repeating all these measurements later. Uh, we are installing in the moment hundreds of sensors in all these boreholes and with strings of sensors which are buried all the way up to 300 meters in. And um, as is indicated here, and then we will have a second imaging borehole on the other side. So uh, we want to measure everything that can tell us what is the rock doing once we start changing properties, where once we start injecting water and producing quakes. And of course, uh, we have the numerical modeling part of it. We have a 10 gigabit line that gets data out of this massive sensor uh, system and is connected directly to the supercomputer center, both in uh, the Swiss supercomputer center in, in uh, Lugano and the, in, and the same in uh, ETH in Zurich. And uh, in addition, we have the various um, laboratories where we are bringing the rocks that we extract from uh, this ball in order to check also at a small scale if we're able to reproduce the same physical phenomena, both for the nucleation, the propagation, and the stopping of the quake. Now, in terms of key questions that we want to check, uh, we listed all of these questions here. I'm not going to read them all, but these are questions that have to do with how do earthquake nucleate, propagate, and arrest? That's a key question. What is then the role of the pre-test conditions of fluids? Uh, can we observe some of this before? And what can we observe before? Is that geochemical? Are these gases? Are this what? We want to see what happens in the rock down there. And then we want to know what is the role of what happens outside of the fault. The first presentation today was uh, talking about a seismic slip, essentially creep on a fault. What is the role of creeping in the rock surrounding faults? And also what are implications for safe extractions or georesources? Now, in terms of scaling up, if you're looking at uh, injected volume of water versus magnitude, uh, until now we had uh, injections of waters and uh, produced quakes around the globe under non-control environment like Sulz or Basel or Pohang. These were really quakes generated all the way to magnitude five and a half, but by industrial projects. What we want to do is produce quakes all the way to magnitude one, perhaps two, under fully controlled environment. And uh, this will allow us really to check what the rock does before producing this. And if we do it under control environment, we will then be able to expand and uh, project how a real fault behaves when it is subjected to this variation of stresses. We expect to record millions of microquakes ranging all the way from minus six to one to two in magnitude, and then correlate this information with stress, strain, and ultimately with the conditions observed on real faults. Now, this is of course very, very ambitious, but so is the ERC program. And uh, that's uh, why we're very, thankful that the ERC decided to fund this research. Uh, many thanks. Uh, and I think appropriately, um, our project is called FEAR, which stands for Fault Activation and Earthquake Rapture. Uh, and it's a fact that earthquake should continue to inst instill fear in us, but we hope 
all of us, all the speakers today, hope that with better knowledge, some of this fear can be taken out. Many thanks. Thank you very much, Domenico. Um, I guess uh, that's, I have a quick question and then we can go to the uh, question and answers. You mentioned fear and I'm wondering whether you do not fear that even that uh, when you have these controlled uh, conditions that you will not generate a larger quake. We are not running you away, are. you mean, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> We, we have done every possible modeling that it's possible to do. To be honest, we are at one kilometer depth in a rather uh, a seismic area. Uh, we are conducting now stimulations with increasing volume of rocks on some of the faults that are in there. This is not yet the fear experiment but we are just stimulating the rock and we're just checking what the rock does. We have already produced tens of thousands of microquakes, and we're trying to relate how much, if you will like, change of stress or change of borehole or the change of um, what type of perturbation do you have to apply in order to generate quakes or work money. So we are calibrating the rock systems because, of course, Mark Massimo was explaining the difference between triggered and induced quakes before. We know well how to induce quake. We want to avoid that we trigger a quake that per se is not using the stresses that we give to it, but it's using the local tectonic stresses that comes from the compression in the Alps. And so we need to make sure that that does not happen. And we wanna distinguish when that happened. So we have a very, very detailed risk assessment and risk study that has to be obeyed in each one of these injections, which was approved by the local authorities and by the cantonal authorities. and. So has been seen at all possible level. Uh, I should also say that something that helps is that we are using, we are working in Switzerland. Switzerland is very much used to work under the Alps. Uh, they are used to generate also quakes when they drill tunnels inadvertently. So there is a, almost a culture of it. But it's true that we would like to make sure of what we are actually producing and not make mistakes. Thank you very much, Domenico. So now we will move on to the question and answer session. Do we have to do anything special? I was going to first go to the chat and uh, see what questions there are there. Uh, I guess I can just go. So um, there is a question for Massimo, which I think uh, Domenico answered uh, partially at least. Uh, Massimo highlighted the difference between triggered and induced anthropogenic earthquakes. Are there proven examples of induced earthquakes? Which economic activities are more risky, more prone to induce earthquakes? Massimo, do you want to answer this question? Yeah, thank you, thank you. And I, I was muted, I'm sorry for that. Yeah, this is a very good question because um, in principle, uh, earthquakes occur in the crust and therefore we call natural only those earthquakes that occur in areas uh, that are already well known to be seismic hazard areas. Therefore, uh, we know. But in general, the answer is yes. There are examples of earthquakes that are only generated by the anthropogenic action. And uh, we have a lot of examples. Uh, the most uh, evident are those for which you have, for instance, mining industry, which is uh, doing activities in the middle of the plate where there is no earthquakes or no say, actual uh, seismicity, current seismicity. And you see that the seismicity is modulated by the anthropogenic activity. The issue is that these earthquakes usually are small and uh, therefore, but uh, they might, you might have also earthquakes uh, that can reach a magnitude to produce some um, damages. So yes, there are uh, examples. The activities can be very different. It can be mining, it can be georesources, it can be storage, it can be uh, fluid injections. Uh, fracking is only one of the examples. Usually people believe that fracking is the example uh, valid for everywhere. This is not the case. There are a lot of georesources activities which are uh, different from fracking and you can generate an earthquake. The difficulty is that uh, when you have a fault, 
uh, we don't know if the state, the mechanical state of the fault. Marie Violet and Domenico manage, uh, discussed this. And therefore, when uh, you have an earthquake, uh, which is associated to, for instance, fluid injections of some anthropogenic activity, uh, and you don't know the mechanical state of the earthquake, uh, it is uh, not uh, so easy to answer if the earthquake, uh, how much of the earthquake is naturally triggered or induced. And triggered also is difficult because triggered means a clock advance or a clock delay, which means knowing the clock and knowing the recurrence time, which is of course uh, far from being uh, uh, feasible. So about induced earthquakes, if I may make a comment, so there is a good example, I guess in the context of fracking, but in Oklahoma in the United States, where if you look at the seismicity map before they started the industrial activity, there was absolutely uh, no uh, seismic activity or very little. And all, uh, all of a sudden you now have on the maps uh, a big uh, uh, bunch of, of earthquakes uh, that reach magnitudes. I think the largest one was almost six. Um, yeah, yeah. So. yeah, this is the case. And indeed, for seismologists, the most difficult question is when you are in an active areas with anthropogenic activities and with, you don't know the level, the background seismicity level or the recurrence time or large magnitude earthquake. And you are asked by national authorities or by the industry to understand if the earthquake are natural, triggered or induced because uh, this is a seismic area, seismicity is present, we don't know much. Uh, we know that when you do fluids uh, injection or fluid extraction, you perturb the mechanical states of these faults and therefore you can trigger and, and as well as you can use. Therefore in this case, and there are examples, I prefer, do not prefer to avoid to make examples with the name and place, but there are. Okay, thank uh, you Massimo. I can uh, add a, a small comment. If yes. I mean, um, I mean, for us, the main the fear experiment will be conducted in this underground lab, but the, all the other experiments that are being run in this lab are funded in large part by either the European Union, for example, with the Geothermica Era Net program, or other projects which are geared toward geoenergy, safe exploitation of geoenergy, safe extraction, or directly from our Ministry of Energy. That means the connection between induced quakes and the utilization of geothermal resources is very, very strict. And uh, many projects in Europe have been stopped because of possible uh, induced quakes. And so we do need to control them before we can move ahead a large scale with the use of geothermal resources. Geothermal resources are there. We know the rock is hot and uh, we just need to be able to take it out in a safe way. Thank you, Domenico. So now let's move on to a question for Marc-André. Is this the first time fiber optics is used to measure fault movement? What are the expected progress in the future? Marc-André. Um, thanks, Barbara. Um, as far as I know, it's the first attempt to use, well, BUTDR as a technique to measure fault movement. Uh, like I said, it's it's been used on, on dams, on pipelines to detect uh, uh, leaks and, and things like that, or to detect fissures and cracks. But for earthquakes and, and fault movement, to the best of my knowledge, it's the first attempt. Again, for the BOTDR technique. Now, DAS has, been, which is the distributed acoustic sensing, that has been used already by several groups, well, by Philippe Jousset, who was here earlier, by the uh, Nate Lindsay and Biondo Biondi, the, the Stanford Berkeley group. Um, they recorded earthquakes using fibers and they've also, and the DAS, and they've also observed seismic waves propagating through the Earth's crust and then reverberating in fault zones using the DAS technique. So um, in a sense, yeah, there's been advances, but the, the BOTDR has, to the best of my knowledge, not yet been applied to faults. As far as what's the expected progress, um, the well, the hope is that uh, if we can demonstrate that using BOTDR, uh, we can detect strain along the path of a, of a fiber optic cable, um, then hopefully we can apply this to other areas and maybe other areas where we don't necessarily 
um, have to go down and put in a new fiber optic cable across a fault. Now, ideally, uh, we could benefit from the use of the telecom cables, the submarine telecom cables, which span the, the Earth's oceans and cross, uh, they cross the Pacific, they cross the Atlantic, they, they connect 99% uh, of all of our internet, all of our bank data, all of our Netflix, all of that stuff all goes through fiber optic cables. Problem is there, the currently used telecom cables may not be designed um, to allow BOTDR measurements to be done because basically they, they tend to be in a loose configuration and they try to be as isolated from the environment and as protected from the environment around them as possible. And on the contrary, if you want to detect strain, you want to be connected to the environment around you. So that is a sort of a technical obstacle which we're looking into and hopefully we're going to try to find a way to surmount. I'm not familiar with uh, this technique, but I'm a little bit familiar with DAS through the work of Nate Lindsay, who was a student at Berkeley. But um, uh, so do you need dark fiber? I mean, what? Um... Um, we need, well, we need fiber and yeah. to hopefully cross an area where there's going to be strain. Mm -hmm. But again, right now, at, at least based on the few tests that we've done, preliminary tests we've done on, on telecom cables, uh, in the lab and with otherwise individual fibers in the lab, um, we think that loosely bound fibers are not well coupled to the environment and will not provide good strain measurements. At least that's what we think right now. In our experiment, we'll have three tightly bound fibers and two loosely bound fibers, and maybe the sig signal is attenuated or, or maybe it's distributed more in time or so hopefully we will at least be able to see what the response of those two different types of configurations are. Well, this is dedicated. And that, that's dedicated. Right. And right now the existing fiber, again, as far as I know, all telecom fiber is in loosely bound and is not tightly bound. Because the drawbacks of tightly bound configuration is that when you're uh, deploying the submarine cables, uh, they're subjected to very large stresses and weights and, and, and they're bent. That's why there's armoring around the fiber, the central fibers, the core fibers, and um, and if they're in a tightly bound configuration, you risk breaking the fibers. And if you break the middle of your, you know, thousand kilometer long fiber, then you're not a happy camper enough to patch it up and replace it. But are you saying that you could uh, use uh, the uh, telecommunication fibers while they are actively using them themselves? At present, we think not. I th right now, I'm thinking more that we would need to develop a hybrid kind of cable, which would have some, which would have the loosely bound fibers in the core to be used by the telecom industry, and then maybe some tightly bound fibers um, elsewhere within the, the cable itself. Right, so that you would not really be able to kind of profit or take advantage of the existing cables then. At this time, no, we don't think we can take advantage of the existing um, networks and that we probably have to try to piggyback onto future projects and using a different um, cable design. That's our current thinking, but again, we haven't actually gone out there and deployed our, our cable because that's what we're planning on doing in one month. Yeah. Uh, sorry for asking. Yeah, so, oh, sorry. Uh, there are also abandoned cables that have been replaced by more powerful, more also, those cannot be used because those are sitting are sit in there in a sense. They, they can be used for DAS, um, and, and that's been demonstrated. And um, there have been several examples. Anthony Sladin down in Nice, um, and he's going to be using a cable, I think, going uh, to Monaco with uh, Monaco Telecom. Um, and he he recently published a paper also on you know on the use of, of DAS on, on submarine cables. Uh, there was the there's another technique which is the the time shift, the time phase, the Mara uh, et al. technique. They published um, work using uh, land and submarine um, telecom cables in the UK, in Italy, and then one between Malta and Sicily. And so that technique works um, on existing telecom um, fibers. But right now with the BUTDR seems to require good coupling to the cable and therefore good coupling to the substratum. At least that's what we think right now. And one more question, which is, uh, so this technique is, uh, is 
geared towards a very low frequency signals, right? Or DC signals, or you know, how high in frequency do you expect to be able to? Uh, well, the DAS uh, is very is is oh, DAS, very yes, high but, response, know, yeah. So yeah. it it will measure the passage of a seismic wave. It can measure yes. uh, cars driving by. It can mm -hmm. uh, measure really small um, energy level, uh, you know, perturbations. Uh, the BOTDR is uh, more of a long term. It's a it's a it's a shift between the current state of stress and the current you know geometry to a new either extended or shortened geometry. I kind of compare it to looking at the speedometer on your car, telling you how fast you drive. That's what the DAS is, and the BOTDR is more like looking at the odometer, telling you that you've driven 135,000 kilometers. You come back next week and it tells you you've driven 135,200 kilometers. And that shift between how far you've driven before and how far you have driven now, that's what the BOTDR will tell you, ideally. And so you hope to be able to detect something across this particular fault during the experiment. What yeah. makes you think this will happen? <laughs> um, well, on the one hand, um, it's... It is like I showed offshore a fault system, which on the flank of Mount Etna has been shown by uh, laser, oh. well, by, sorry, SAR. So um, the satellite uh, um, uh, interferometry with the fringes by Bonforta et al, as well as by geodesy, land-based geodesy. Um, it's a system which has uh, movements on individual fault strands of about three to five millimeters per year. And there's about five of them on the southeast flank of Mount Etna. And when you accumulate all of that, you're getting about two centimeters per year of movement. And the movement that the Germans, that Maria Olaub and the Gilmar team showed over a about a two-year deployment period was uh, one single four centimeter slow slip event. So you're about in the same ballpark. Now, of course, that we people who work on faults know that it's not because a fault moves on average two centimeters per year that it will move two centimeters every year. It might not move for 10 years and then it might move 20 centimeters all at once. So we don't know which of those options will happen or if something in between might happen. But based on the morphological aspect of that fault, based on the seafloor mapping we've done with the bathymetry, as well as the couple of seismic profiles I showed, um, it looks like a very fresh fault. It's breaking through to the seafloor. We're gonna do some micro a micro bathymetric survey um, in a month before we go down and deploy the cable, um, we should have very, very nice images of that fault. And it shows all the signs of being a beautiful, active dextrose strike slip fault, kind of like the North Anatolian fault, but um, just elsewhere and not next to Istanbul, next to Catania. Thank you. So there is a question here which is to everybody, but uh, we'll see who answers it. Given the difficulty to monitor submarine faults, why are they chosen for monitoring? For example, with fiber optics, are these used on land? Okay, why, why do you, I guess it's a question for you again. Why do you go to the seafloor rather than on land? Okay, um, I'll try to make it short so others can also um, answer. Yes, right, we um, should uh, the, move the on to some other. The problem with the is sensitive to temperature and to strain. So if you're on land, you're gonna have a very strong temperature signal, which will be kind of hard to filter out. Down on the seafloor, we're gonna be working in 2000 meter water depth. This, the temperature is almost constant. And we will actually have temperature measurements as well, but it's basically, it's a very nice environment. It's a very quiet environment. And um, so I think it's best for that. And um, yes, there are telecom cables crossing the, the Etna flank faults on, on shore, but you will have to deal with all of the temperature fluctuations and all of the anthropogenic uh, disturbances, traffic, construction, um, um, farming, uh, whatever. So I think it's it's an easier, quieter environment, but it is very expensive as far as the equipment you need to use on the seafloor, unfortunately. I can Thank provide you very an answer, Barbara, if you wish. Yes. Yeah, so the, the, there are several reasons why we need to monitor. The first and most important, because they can generate tsunami, if they have vertical, in this case, being a uh, right lateral, uh, it will not be the most dangerous, but in general, uh, Tohoku earthquake, it clearly showed us- That's that the in, earthquake in Japan. In Japan in 2010, 2011. with the famous uh, tsunami with the Fukushima 
um, nuclear power plant uh, disaster. In that case, we were able to reconstruct the source model only for the, not only, but mainly due to the um, uh, sea bottom geodesy. Otherwise, it would be almost impossible only with the observation on land to reconstruct the, the sleep model and the aqua rupture model. And the second reason is that uh, because we have a lot of uh, making a link with the previous question on induced seismicity, we have a lot of uh, uh, anthropogenic activities that are offshore. And we have a lot of examples in Spain and in the Northern Sea where there were earthquake induced by these activities. Therefore, we know to know the mechanical states of these faults. And the third one is because, uh, which is specific to the example of the, uh, this presentation, is because the Etna deformation, it is, uh, of course, associated to the magna intrusion of the Etna volcanoes, but there is a huge deformation on that area. And there is also always difficult to understand how much this is due to the summital volcanic activities. Uh, for instance, there was uh, just last year a huge movement of the formation that is like an horizontal dike. And therefore, to know which is the state of the formation offshore is fundamental to understand the mechanical states of the volcano. So these are three reasons why they are important. Thank you, Massimo. I could add um, a detail, for example, in these deep labs that we are setting up, uh, we bury um, dust systems uh, all over the place. So we bury cables in each one of the boreholes when we cement, uh, it's, we always bury in cables because these technologies are developing so fast uh, that once these are cemented in, uh, later we will be able to apply the newer technology. So both along the tunnel and in the main boreholes, we do bury fibers. Yeah, and there is quite a few uh, experiment, quite a few groups that are getting into the this kind of uh, uh, research uh, that are working uh, on land primarily. Yes. Okay. Any uh, anybody wants to ask another question from anybody? I maybe can ask one, but I've been asking questions, so I'd like to make sure I'm not the only one. Um, so I have. Two questions. One uh, is for Massimo, a uh, quick one. Uh, given uh, the experience that you have with EPOS now and uh, the fantastic kind of coordination and uh, uh, kind of uh, joining of resources that you have been able to provide, are there any plans for you to use your experience or the system that you developed to help other communities than the geosciences? Uh, de develop uh, similar. I mean, there is a need uh, in many other communities for uh, this kind of. Uh, there is a, still a lot of work to be done in solid earth science. <laughs> 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 because uh, the culture of data sharing uh, is not so deep as uh, we can imagine. And more important, uh, because uh, even if uh, when you have a culture of data sharing, when you have a single lab producing data, is not a matter of culture of data sharing. It's the real capacity to have the expertise and the resources to share the data. Therefore, there is still a lot of work in solid earth science. And even if next year I will be mostly committed with the ERC, I will dedicate the remaining part in trying to help the communities in having the resources and the tools and the solutions to simplify the data sharing. Thank you. I guess I was asking from my naive point of view as a seismologist because the seismological community is, I guess, one a good one in terms of uh, uh, sharing data in general. Okay, so we still have one minute, and I'd like to ask Marie a little whether she could explain a little bit more about how what she is learning about uh, since she is, um, you know, using fluids in her um, in her experiments whether she is also learning something about uh, how, you know, about more of, of the physics of how the fluids, um, you know, interact with the fault, or is that not uh, part of the project? No, no, this is part of the project, is the main goal of the project. So uh, about the fluids, we, um, we are playing with different uh, fluid properties, and we learned that the thermodynamics of the fluids uh, play a role in the dynamic weakening, 
We learn also that the fluid rheology lies in the viscosity, play a huge role both in nucleation and propagation of the earthquakes. We also learn from the lab that the porphyrite pressure can uh, decrease the initial state of the fault, and this will influence the rupture velocity. We have a paper that will come soon uh, in Nature Communication about that rupture velocity and uh, seismic uh, uh, slip velocities. So yes, fluid influence a lot of parameters. Thank you very much. I guess we are out of time. So now I should just um, well conclude and thank very much all the speakers and uh, the organizers. Again, thank uh, Claudia and David for organizing uh, uh, and orchestrating this session, and also the technical assistance uh, of ESOF uh, and the uh, discussion part. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone.